Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today. We are going to get started in about a minute, uh, just giving everybody time to settle in. Wonderful. Well, we will get started. Welcome to everyone joining us today for this 2022 National Virtual Leukemia Conference. This one-of-a-kind conference addresses the unique needs of the blood cancer community and offers the latest information, tools, and resources to help support Canadians affected by leukemia. The Leukemia and Lymphoma Society of Canada is proud to introduce today's presentation titled Chronic Myeloid Leukemia, CML. What it is, how it's treated, and minimizing side effects. In this session, Dr. Kareem Jamani, hematologist at the Alberta Health Services, will provide an overview of CML, will discuss treatment options, research advances, and what you can do to minimize the impact and side effects of treatment. Let me introduce myself. My name is Desiree Naylor, and I'm the Community Services Lead for, the, for Alberta here with the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society of Canada. I'll be the moderator of today's online event, since there are many of you, we invite you to type your questions and comments in the question box of your Zoom webinar panel throughout the presentation. An LLSC staff will monitor the questions, and I will read some of the questions aloud at the end of the presentation during the question and answer period. Due to the large number of participants and limited time, we may not be able to answer all questions. Also note that our speaker cannot answer specific questions about a person's health status. Case-specific questions will not be read aloud during the question and answer period. If we do not get to your question during the live presentation, a community services lead will contact you directly after the webinar. Today's presentation will be recorded. Therefore, you can listen to it again on our website. Next slide, please. If you have a lot of questions right now, or you cannot find what you're looking for, you can talk to a community services lead in your area and receive personalized assistance in finding answers to your questions or ways to address your concerns. The community service leads are here to help. Reach out to us by calling toll-free 1-833-222-4884. slide. And we invite you to vis visit our new website, bloodcancers.ca. Our goal is to better serve the community and offer an improved experience. On our website, you will find all of our past webcast recordings, our podcast channel, information sheets, practical tools to help you navigate your cancer experience, and so much more. Visit bloodcancers.ca. Next slide. Also on our new website, you can find a multitude of animated educational videos. The topics vary from information about specific types of blood cancers and recognized treatments. Most recently, we launched a five-part series of videos on CML. The topics range from understanding CML, treatment options, CML in your, your genes, treatment side effects, and caregiving for someone with CML. Visit our website to watch all of these videos. Next slide, please. It is now time to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Kareem Jamani. Dr. Jamani is a hematologist at the Foothills Medical Center in Calgary and has been a clinic, clinical assistant professor at the University of Calgary since 2017. He completed his fellowship in Calgary and Seattle and completed his master's in public health through Harvard. Dr. Jamani is also the clinic director to the Alberta Bone and Marrow Transplant Long-Term Clinic Follow-Up Clinic. Thank you so much for being here today, Dr. Jamani. I'll pass it to you. Great, thanks, Desiree. Um, so thanks everyone for being here. Uh, thank you, Desiree. Thank you to the uh, LLS for putting on this conference, which is uh, so valuable to um, all of us in the blood cancer community. So um, a lot of thanks go out to, to the LLS. Um, so I'd like to cover um, hopefully topics that, that all of us are interested in here. 
um, what is CML, how is it treated, some of the side effects of our common treatments and, and how to try to deal with some of those um, and, and how can we do better, I think is an important part of the presentation as well. Um, because if, you know, if we, if we were exactly where we wanted to be in CML, um, you know, we wouldn't be doing this presentation and there wouldn't be, um, you know, more than a hundred people signed up for it. So we've, we've got some work to do and I'll, uh, preview some of the work that's happening now, um, in CML. <clears throat> so, um, what I'm aiming for is to talk for about 45 minutes. Um, and leave about 15 minutes for questions and answers. Um, we do have some pre-submitted questions, which I will um, do my best to answer. Um, I do wanna provide fairly good uh, detailed content um, because I know uh, patients are uh, more informed than ever these days. And I wanna um, you know, pre present a fairly high level uh, of information for you, but also provide some bottom, bottom line summaries to make sure that I'm not losing you. So what is CML? So CML uh, or chronic myeloid leukemia, if we take a step back in kind of the hierarchy of blood cancers, it's a myeloproliferative neoplasm. And if we break down myeloproliferative, that's two words, myelo referring to the myeloid family of cells in the bone marrow. Um, this is most of the cells in the bone marrow, the red blood cells, the platelets and the white bloods and many of the white blood cells uh, are from the myeloid family and proliferative meaning uh, to grow um, uh, and in this case to grow obsessively and neoplasm meaning cancer or excess growth. So we know that myeloproliferative neoplasms arise in a blood forming stem cell from the bone marrow that has acquired a mutation um, and this leads to overproduction of blood cells. If we have a look at uh, the various forms of MPN, just to couch CML um, uh, to, for, for a better understanding, we've got uh, under this category of myeloproliferative neoplasms, when there are too many platelets, this is a disease called essential thrombocytosis. When the mutation leads to too many red blood cells, this is a disease called polycythemia vera. And when we have a mutation that leads to too many white blood cells, this is CML. And CML accounts for 15 to 20% of leukemias in adults. Um, it's not a very common disease. Uh, there's an annual incidence of only one or two cases per 100,000. Um, but we do have an expanding number of patients with CML across the world. And the reason for that, as I'll show you, is that our treatments uh, for CML have dramatically improved over the last decades. The average age of diagnosis is, is 50 to 60. And, and again, that's just an average. So we have patients who are many patients younger than 50, many patients older than 60. Um, in terms of risk factors, there's really only a single known risk factor, and this is exposure to radiation. And um, because most patients have not been exposed to radiation, most of our patients don't really have any known risk factors. And at this point, it's felt that the mutation that leads to CML is a random, uh, a random event. So how does it happen? So our understanding of CML dramatically improved once the Philadelphia chromosome was discovered. And so chromosomes are the structures inside cells that carry all of our DNA. All of us have 46 chromosomes and they are numbered one through, uh, one through uh, 46, uh, sorry, one through 23. And we have two copies of each, of course, one from each of our parents. And what happens in CML is you take a normal chromosome nine and a normal chromosome 22, and there's a little rearrangement that happens where a piece of chromosome 22 comes off, a piece of chromosome nine comes off, and they recombine to form a new uh, changed chromosome called the Philadelphia chromosome. And really what's happening there is that there's a gene called ABL on chromosome nine, and there's a gene called BCR on chromosome 22, and what happens when the rearrangement happens between chromosome 9 and 22 um, is that the BCR and ABL genes are brought together. And so a fusion gene is formed called BCR-ABL, which is really central to uh, CML. So what is BCR-ABL and what does it do? So BCR-ABL, uh, when these two genes combine, they form a receptor um, that is always on 
And what BCR ABLE does is it stimulates production of white blood cells. And because the receptor is always on and doesn't respond to normal feedback loops that you know, should shut off when enough cells are made, um, the white blood cells uh, grow um, uncontrollably. And so really the bottom line here is in CML, we've got too many white blood cells um, because of a mutation in the blood forming stem cells in the bone marrow. Okay, so what does CML look like? So on the, on the left here, we've got a blood smear um, that's normal. Okay, so this is a drop of blood and it's smeared ac across a glass slide and then stained and we have a look at it under the microscope. And most of the cells here are red blood cells, the, the tiny little dots in between are platelets. And then you've got some white blood cells and you can see four of them here that are stained uh, purple. And you can see here that there's just a few um, white blood cells and they all look fairly the same. Um, in CML, uh, you see here on the right in these two pictures, there is an expanded number of white blood cells and the white blood cells are at various stages of maturation. So they don't all look the same. Um, there's various shapes and various sizes. And, and this is very typical of CML. In terms of symptoms, um, in this day and age, in about half of patients, there are no symptoms and CML is detected just on routine blood work. Um, a, a very common story these days is a patient goes in for a, a routine uh, physical exam with their family doctor and ha they have some routine blood work done and their white blood cell count is high. And that, that's a fairly common story these days. Um, and those who do have symptoms, though, um, fatigue, weight loss, drenching sweats, um, abdominal fullness, feeling full easily, and these are last two are related to enlargement of the spleen, uh, these would be the most common symptoms. And CML is diagnosed, uh, as you know, with a bone marrow biopsy. Um, and what we're seeing in the bone marrow biopsy is an expansion of those white blood cells, like I talked about, like we saw in the pictures of the blood films on the previous slide. There's an expanded number of white blood cells here in this patient's bone marrow. There are also some other uh, specific abnormalities that our uh, pathologists are looking for in terms of diagnosing CML. But really, the diagnosis comes down to detecting that Philadelphia chromosome. And so what, what can be done is we can extract those chromosomes from the bone marrow sample and splay them out. And we can actually see the change that happens between chromosome 9 and 22, the arrows um, in, this, uh, in this setting. And, and that change between chromosome 9 and 22 macroscopically here is pretty hard to see. Um, but uh, learning how to look at chromosomes under the microscope is an entire field in itself. And so we rely on uh, specialists uh, who uh, specifically are trained to look at these chromosomes and tell us what's normal and what's abnormal. Um, the other thing that is really important besides finding the Philadelphia chromosome, um, as shown here on the right, is actually detecting the BCR ABL protein that results from the uh, translocation 922. And we can detect that by a test called PCR. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, throughout the presentation. CML, you might've heard, uh, comes in three phases. There's a chronic phase, an accelerated phase, and a blast phase. The vast majority of patients at diagnosis are in the chronic phase. And so a lot of our discussion today really centers around treat treatment of chronic phase CML. Um, with an increasing number of blast cells, blast cells are the most immature type of white blood cells. Um, that's what defines the accelerated and the blast phases of CML. And the goal, you know, one of the goals in CML treatment is to obviously keep the disease into the chronic phase. So the bottom line here is a, a bone marrow biopsy is required to diagnose CML. And the vast majority of patients are thankfully in, in chronic phase of diagnosis and, and will stay there long term. So how do we treat CML? And this is uh, with drugs that many of you know called tyrosine kinase inhibitors, otherwise known as TKIs. And what do TKIs do? So here's a, here's a cartoon, and, and really it's important to pay attention to the top of the cartoon here, um, where we're showing uh, the BCR-ABL protein, 
Okay, so this is the protein that results from that translocation between chromosomes 9 and 22. The BCR ABL protein um, has a binding site um, up here where this, this protein called ATP binds. And ATP is uh, available basically in, in all of our cells. Um, it's a source of energy for our cells. And so it's fairly easy for BCR ABL to be always active because there's lots of ATP to sit in this site and keep the protein on. Um, but what tyrosine kinase inhibitors do in this case, uh, this is a picture of imatinib, uh, is imatinib or other TKIs will go and sit in this ATP binding site and shut down the BCR ABL protein. Now the challenge, um, as you'll as as you might have experienced yourself, or as a family member might have experienced, is that the imatinib and other TKIs don't just sit on the BCR ABL protein; they sit on a a broad number of tyrosine kinase proteins throughout our body um, that have nothing to do with CML. And this is what we call an off-target effect. So all of these drugs will sit and interrupt the, will sit in and interrupt the, uh, the processes of normal, healthy tyrosine kinases throughout our body. And this is really what mediates all of the side effects of these drugs. So we now have five uh, TKIs to treat CML. They come in three generations. The first generation, the original drug that was developed to treat CML um, is imatinib, otherwise known as Gleevec. There are three second generation drugs, disatinib, nilotinib, and bosutinib. And there's a third generation drug, panatinib. Um, most of, all of these drugs are readily available in Canada with varying uh, criteria for prescribing them uh, by province. And two of these drugs are now generic. Uh, Matinib has gone generic several years ago. Dasatinib has gone generic uh, in the last year or so. Uh, and the, the remaining three uh, are still um, on patent. So how do we measure response? How do we know that patients with CML are responding to their tyrosine kinase inhibitor treatment? And this is really where the quantitative uh, measurement of the BCR ABL copies in blood is very important. And that's by that test called PCR, where we're detecting the amount of BCR ABL that's in the blood. Um, so obviously when, when a patient with CML starts treatment, the very first thing we want to see is we want to see that white blood cell count come back down to normal. And if the spleen was enlarged at diagnosis, we want to see the spleen come back down to a normal size. Um, but that's really just the very first step and what's important after that is seeing the number of BCR ABL copies in the blood come down. So this big circle would be, say, the load of BCR ABL copies in someone's blood at diagnosis. And at three months on therapy, we're hoping to see what we would call a one log reduction. So that's a tenfold decrease in copies of BCR ABL in the blood. Um, and that is what's called an early molecular response. At six months, we're hoping to see a two log reduction. So that would be a hundred fold decrease in BCR ABL copies. And at the one year mark, we're hoping to see a three log reduction. So that would be a 1000 fold, de uh, that would be a 1000 fold decrease in BCR ABL copies. And that would be referred to as a major molecular response. Um, and at any time beyond 12 months, we're hoping to achieve uh, a four or 4.5 log reduction referred to as an MR4 4.5. Uh, this is a, a very deep response where there is uh, very little BCR ABL left in the blood um, and is uh, quite important for potentially being a candidate for stopping treatment, as we'll talk about um, later in the presentation. So I, I noted that the three month and the 12 month time points are important. I'll go back and show you that the three month time point, the early molecular response the 12 month time point, the major molecular response. These are really important. Um, and the reason is they predict an excellent outcome for patients with CML. So for patients who achieve the one log at three months, the vast majority will go on to achieve that three log reduction at the one year mark. And for these patients, progression of CML is very rare. Uh, these patients are more likely to achieve that deep molecular response at four, 4.5 log reduction and be candidates for stopping therapy. Um, and some studies have shown 
the overall survival of patients who meet these milestones will be very similar to someone who has never been diagnosed with CML. Um, so what can you do to meet these milestones? If you're very early in your CML treatment, or in fact, at any point in your CML treatment, it's really important to avoid missing doses of medication. And this can't be overstated. Um, there's some early seminal work um, looking at uh, missing doses, and even three missed doses a month um, seem to impair chances of reaching important milestones. So three missed doses a month is really not even one dose per week missed. And so it's really important, um, even these tiny uh, missed doses can make a big difference in terms of response. The other important thing is to have follow-up lab work done on time um, so that we can you know, monitor response exactly at these time points. So the bottom line um, here is that we've got five TKIs. These are targeted oral medications uh, to treat CML. They're highly effective. Uh, the response to these TKIs is measured by log reductions in the BCR ABL protein. And the survival of patients with CML has dramatically improved over the last decades because of these medications. And I'll show you that uh, visually here. So this is um, data from the MD Anderson Cancer Center um, in, the, in the United States where they have a huge population of CML patients. And you can see here that decade, essentially decade over decade, the number of patients with CML surviving uh, has improved uh, quite dramatically. So the, uh, the upwards axis here, uh, the y-axis is the percentage of patients surviving. And obviously the x-axis down here is over years. And each sequential time period that they presented, there were more and more patients surviving. Um, we can say that, you know, that, that curve looks even better um, at this point. This is uh, data from the um, original clinical trial that studied imatinib, the first tyrosine kinase inhibitor um, against what was previously the standard treatment for CML, a combination of drugs uh, called interferon and cytarabine. Um, and we can see here that uh, the vast majority of patients are doing very well. This is follow-up out to just beyond 10 years on treatment um, with over 80% of patients surviving. It's important to know that about half of the deaths here were not even related to CML. And, and that brings up another point, which I'll, I'll chat about in a, in a few slides. Um, and the reason there wasn't a big difference between the two treatments, meaning these curves are fairly close together, is because um, the trial allowed patients to switch. So if they weren't responding to the interferon and cytarabine, the patients were allowed to switch to imatinib, um, which, is, which is good trial design, uh, because we, obviously we don't want to let patients stay on treatment that's failing. So the question is, can, can we do better? And, and as I alluded to, uh, the answer is, is definitely yes. Um, so how can we do better? And really, there's a few points here. So the first thing is CML has turned into a chronic disease. Patients are living for years and years and, and decades even with CML. And so we need to really focus on side effects and improving quality of life for patients. This is a, a disease that the vast majority of patients diagnosed with will live for long, long term. Um, so we need to learn how to manage and prevent side effects. Um, if we can get patients off treatment, that's probably the best way to minimize side effects and improve quality of life. And that's called treatment-free remission, which we'll talk about. And if we can't do treatment-free remission, maybe we can minimize the dose of treatment that people are on, and that may help improve uh, the side effect profile as well. The other, the other prong here is improving response and preventing progression of CML, really important goals. And that um, you know, comes down to trying to recognize those who are at risk of progression of CML and intervening early. And then novel, novel or new therapies that are coming down the line. Um, and I'll speak to one uh, specifically that's showing a lot of promise. So let's talk a little bit about side effects. And there are some key principles here. Side effects are tough. It's tough to talk um, to, you know, I'm a very diverse group of patients um, who probably have a very diverse set of uh, possible side effects, varying severity, um, varying, varying types of side effects. And so I can, I can give some general, um, I can give some general advice here and, and hopefully you'll find something useful um, for you here. Um, some general principles, 
have an ongoing dialogue with your team. And, and I emphasize team because um, most CML treatment centers um, involve more than just a doctor. Um, there might be nurse practitioners involved. There may be nurses involved. There may be pharmacists. Um, there may be uh, physiotherapists. Um, and there may be dietitians. And so um, all of all of these, uh, you know, what we call a multidisciplinary team, all of the members of a multidisciplinary team are, are very important and, and might be able to help you um, with some of the side effects that you are experiencing. Um, know who to call. So when you're starting therapy, when you're on therapy, it's really important to know who do you call? Who do you call if you're having terrible side effects between visits? Um, hopefully you have that information. Keep a log. Um, oftentimes we're making changes in treatments um, or we're hoping that things are going to get better in treat with treatment. And so it's really important to keep track of how your symptoms are doing and, and how they're changing over time. It's pretty tough to remember details around this um, without writing them down. Um, keep up with regular blood work as prescribed. We're not just looking for response um, in CML uh, with blood work. We're also looking for side effects of treatment. Um, and so it's really important to have the, the blood work regularly. Um, if you can stick with it, uh, a lot of side effects we know improve over the first few months of treatment and new side effects with some exceptions that I'll mention are, are pretty rare after the first year. So um, if you can um, try to stick with it, but we know that severe or persistent troublesome side effects, especially ones that impair quality of life um, can require temporary holds of treatment. Uh, dose changes, switches to alternative treatments, and, and that's just the reality of treating CML. So here are some common side effects of tyrosine kinase inhibitors. There are blood work abnormalities that we are keeping an eye out for. The, the most important ones are, are what we call hematologic um, side effects. So that means blood counts being a little bit too low. Um, inflammation of the liver, that's important for us to keep an eye on. Um, in terms of symptoms, the most common ones uh, are listed here, and we'll try and go through them one by one here and, and break them down a little bit. So nausea and diarrhea, the main culprits in terms of treatment here are imatinib and vasubinib, but certainly you can see these with any of the tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Um, nausea, it can be challenging. Um, it's really important to take uh, the medication with food if you can. Uh, the star there is uh, with nilotinib, it should not be taken with food, um, but the rest of the tyrosine kinase inhibitors are okay to be taken with a meal. Um, as with any nausea, it's important to not leave your stomach empty, so eat small, small meals or snacks throughout the day. Um, experiment with timing of taking the drug. I've had patients uh, switch to a certain time of day, which seems to just work a lot better for them, such as before bedtime. Um, Use anti-nausea medications if the nausea is persisting. So there are some patients who just require a bit of an anti-nausea dose before their medications uh, regularly. And you don't wanna lock yourself into anti-nauseants. If you're, if you're on anti-nauseants and, and you're doing really well, you, know, you can experiment with uh, taking them off and, and seeing if you don't need them anymore. Because as, as we kind of mentioned, over the first months of treatment, the side effects tend to improve spontaneously. Diarrhea can be a problem, and some recommendations um, if you're having diarrhea near the beginning of treatment are to temporarily avoid spicy, fatty food, caffeine, raw fruits, and vegetables, but obviously you can reintroduce these when diarrhea has improved. Um, Anti-diarrheal medications like Imodium can be useful. Uh, stay really well hydrated. It's important to think about other causes. So I've had patients where we've worked uh, to try and control the diarrhea, but it wasn't until we looked at their whole medication list and found that there were other culprits that we had to play around with to make their diarrhea better. Um, some patients are lactose intolerant, uh, lactose intolerant, and so it's important to think about whether there are other causes of diarrhea at play. Um, your, your log of symptoms can help try to identify these causes as well. Um, with basutinib, uh, we found that slowly introducing the drug is, is really important. So if you're going on to basutinib, a very slow ramp up of the dose uh, we found really helps to, to try to avoid terrible diarrhea. Um, if you're having diarrhea chronically, it'd be uh, useful to speak with a registered dietitian 
uh, there are often good tips from a uh, dietary perspective that they're able to provide. And, and that just speaks again to having you know, a multidisciplinary team at your side during treatment. Swelling uh, can be an issue. Um, the main culprits tend to be imatinib and desatinib, but again, this can happen with any tyrosine kinase inhibitor. The swelling can be around the eyes or in the legs. Um, really elevating your legs when sitting or lying down can help. Um, if the swelling is around the eyes, elevating the head while sleeping can help. Uh, limiting salt intake, that's just good advice for anyone. Um, some patients need a bit of a diuretic or a water pill to help get rid of some excess fluid. Um, with the swelling around the eyes, it can be problematic, especially if it's starting to impair uh, your vision. And this can sometimes be a reason that patients need to switch, particularly from the matinib that can cause fairly bad swelling around the eyes in some cases. Um, there is a condition called pleural effusion. It's really important to know about this if you're on the satinib. Um, what this means is fluid accumulates around the lung. This can happen, this is one of those things that can happen at any time during treatment. So we've seen this in patients who have been on desatinib with no problems for several years, and all of a sudden they've got fluid around their lungs. What we found is that it often happens after a cold or a flu or, or some sort of infection. Um, and symptoms would include shortness of breath or a persistent dry cough. So it's really important if you're on desatinib and you're having some new symptoms with your chest, uh, with breathing or, or a cough to, to let your CML um, team know right away um, because you will need an x-ray to, to look for fluid around the lung. This can be quite challenging. Um, needing a temporary break from desatinib is very common for pleural effusion. Uh, it does tend to settle down. However, it can come back after the drug is restarted. And it is a common reason that some patients need to switch from desatinib to an alternative tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So rash, um, the culprit here is all of them. So basically all tyrosine kinase inhibitors can cause a rash. It's fairly common. Um, they do tend to get better with time, even as the drug is continued. Um, so general skincare tips can help try to get you through the early period. Staying well hydrated helps to maintain your, your skin barrier and skin health using kind of gentle or basic soaps, avoiding heavy scents and colors wearing lightweight cotton clothing, protecting your skin in the sun, because some of these rashes um, are exacerbated by uh, exposure to the sun. Um, allergy medications can be used if the rash is itchy, and sometimes steroids to be applied on the skin are, are prescribed as well. Um, unfortunately, a small number of patients will have severe skin reactions um, to these drugs particularly if there's blistering or peeling of the skin, or if there's ulcers in the mouth associated with the rash. Um, these are things that need to be evaluated um, immediately and, and the drug should be stopped until these are sorted out. Muscle cramps can also be a problem with all of these drugs. <clears throat> they often involve the feet, calves, and the hands. So during the cramp, stretching the muscle is probably the most useful thing that can be done. Some, some patients will jump into a warm bath or shower. Some people use cold massage techniques. Uh, um, and really prevention is the key here. So daily stretching is what's been shown to be the most useful. Um, getting into a daily stretching routine, staying well hydrated, doing some light exercise before bed can help to prevent cramps from happening. Uh, some people have found B complex vitamins to be helpful or calcium and magnesium supplements. Um, but the evidence in, in the literature for these working is, is definitely mixed. Aches and pains um, can be a problem for sure. And, and the culprits again are all of these drugs. Um, there's various sites and types of pains uh, that patients describe. This, these can be pains in the muscles, pains in the joints, a deep kind of bony pain or a neuropathy type pain. Some patients describe a burning under the skin. Um, each case is different um, and really needs further testing, um, particularly if the symptoms are severe or persistent. Um, it's, it's hard to give a little more direction here because every patient is a little bit different with their pain, but it's important to keep a log of the pain, where it is, how it's progressing over time. Um, and especially if it, you're having neuropathy type pain, is it affecting your sensation, your ability to feel your fingers or toes? 
Is it affecting your strength in your in your uh, arms or legs? These are important things to keep track of and, and discuss with your team. In terms of fatigue, the culprit here is essentially all cancers and, and all treatments for cancer. Fatigue is really tough and, and this could really be a presentation all in itself. Um, and I'm not sure if anyone has all the answers, um, but fatigue often comes along with uh, other symptoms. So side effects of treatment, poor sleep, pain, uh, distress, anxiety, depression, these are all often wrapped up uh, in fatigue uh, for patients with cancer. And managing fatigue is difficult. Um, and so, you know, a, a little bit of an outline here um, is what are the physical symptoms uh, that you're having and, and can they be treated and, and managed? Because if you're constantly nauseous or constantly in pain, that's really going to drive the fatigue. Um, we need to look for contributing physical health problems. So, you know, things like a low thyroid, things like sleep apnea can, can really make people fatigued and, and contribute to cancer-related fatigue. Um, identify and treat mental health problems. So um, what's your mood like? Are you feeling anxious? Are you feeling depressed? Are there major stressors in life? Um, and, and sometimes counseling and medications are, are important to try to get things on track. And, you know, there are fatigue-related interventions after this. Uh, exercise programs um, are probably the ones that are consistently shown to have some benefit for patients with cancer-related fatigue. Um, it's counterintuitive, though. I mean, it's hard to get into an exercise program if you're feeling exhausted. Um, I'd say look at your, you know, at your cancer center, at your um, societies uh, that that help cancer patients, and see if there are some cancer uh, exercise programs tailored towards patients um, with cancer that can maybe ease you into things slowly. Um, it's important to just make some small steps forward and not have you know huge expectations for exercise it's something that you really have to ease yourself into and and set uh, small goals and work towards them um, energy conservation techniques um, are, are important it means just being realistic with yourself about what you'll be able to achieve in a day and, and trying to prioritize how you're going to use your energy throughout the day mind body programs things like yoga um, and mindfulness uh, interventions um, cognitive behavioral therapy that are uh, often through, uh, often offered through uh, psychologists. Um, you know, it's important to see if these types of programs are offered through your cancer center. Um, and, and nutrition is very important as well. So, you know, again, reach out to your multidisciplinary team um, in terms of your CML and, and see if, you know, there are programs uh, that you can get involved in. Um, it's really important to talk about cardiovascular disease. Um, some of these drugs can be associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular events. By that, I mean stroke, heart attack, and uh, blockages in arteries in the legs. Um, the main culprits are the newer medications. So the, the biggest risk being with the third generation drug, panatinib, but also nilotinib, dasatinib, and uh, nilotinib and dasatinib. Um, to a lesser extent, basutinib and our original drug imatinib does not seem to have this uh, toxicity. Um, and these can happen anytime during treatment. So the bottom line is it's very important to stay in touch with your primary care provider um, because we all need to have a regular physical and have our blood pressure checked and our cholesterol checked and our blood sugar checked um, and talk about smoking. If, if you're smoking, exercising and eating a healthy diet, and a lot of these things happen through your primary care provider, they are probably more attuned and uh, more up to date on guidelines for treating these conditions than your CML doctor is. Um, and so hopefully your CML doctor and your family doctor can work together um, to help maintain your, your health and uh, reduce your risk of having a cardiovascular event. The other point here is beyond just being on the drugs, um, even if you're on a matinib where there doesn't seem to be a big increased risk of cardiovascular events, cardiovascular events are just common in general for all of us with or without CML. And now that patients with CML are living long lives, um, it's really important to stay on top of your, your general health. So these are things like doing your regular cancer screening, 
um, for for women mammograms and and pap smears and and uh, for both women and men colon cancer screening are really important. Uh, just staying on top of general health um, is is important because most patients with CML these days um, will not die from their CML. So how can we do better? Let's let's touch on. Uh, treatment-free remission and minimizing doses of tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So what does treatment-free remission mean? Uh, it's often abbreviated as TFR, and this really means successfully stopping your tyrosine kinase inhibitor and remaining in a deep remission. And so optimal candidates for treatment-free remission are patients who have been on their tyrosine kinase inhibitor for at least three to five years, they are in a deep molecular response, like we mentioned earlier, at that 4.0 or 4.5 log reduction for at least two years. Um, they are patients who have not had uh, problems with not responding to prior treatments. So if you're on the third line treatment or a second line treatment because the first or second line treatments didn't work, um, that is not usually a good scenario for doing TFR. Um, and the ability to have close follow-up and, and frequent blood work. And so how many patients will achieve treatment for your remission? Unfortunately, it's a minority of patients. So if we take all patients with CML, only about 40% will eventually become eligible for a treatment for your remission. That means they are getting to that 4 or 4.5 log reduction. And of those 40%, about half of them will successfully come off their uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So the usual protocol for TFR is once uh, we've identified a patient that's eligible, we, we obviously are having those discussions with patients and their families. And if the combined decision is to come off the tyrosine kinase inhibitor, we are doing uh, once a month monitoring of the qPCR, especially for the first six months to a year. Um, and monitoring for regression of that for 4.5 log reduction. Um, most of the regressions or relapses uh, happen within the first year. And remarkably, after the first year, it's very rare for, uh, for relapses to happen. But the point is we need to do that lab work very frequently in the first year after stopping treatment to make sure we pick up uh, the relapse um, very early on and and essentially all patients will reachieve their deep molecular response uh, if they relapse um, when they restart their tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So what can you do again for, you know, to maximize the chances of being a candidate for treatment for your mission? Again, it really comes down to being uh, really on top of taking the tyrosine kinase inhibitor and not missing doses. Um, and then doing that regular blood work to ensure we're meeting milestones um, for responses that, as I've shown before. Um, if you're stopping or, or getting close to stopping uh, your drug um, in conjunction in discussion with your CML treatment uh, team, um, be aware that stopping can be associated with, with withdrawal symptoms in about half of patients. So there is an interesting uh, phenomenon that happens um, where patients will develop kind of deep bony aches and pains uh, in the first few months after stopping their uh, treatment. It is self-limited. It does tend to get better over, over a few months, um, but it's important to know this in advance as it, it can require some pain control. Um, and talk with your team about anxiety and, and fear around, around stopping. Um, in, in patient surveys, it's fairly clear that this can be a very anxiety-provoking event. You've been told from the very start of your CML treatment that you have to take your CML drug you really should not miss doses. I've already said that uh, three times already during this presentation, and and now you're stopping. Now you're being told to stop, and so um, there's and there's this possibility that um, we'll we'll lose our deep response after we stop um, about half the time. So it can definitely be a, a very anxiety provoking uh, situation. So so talk with your team about that. Um, some patients choose uh, to not go on with treatment free remission, even though they are candidates, because they'd rather simply stay on the treatment that's working really well for them. And that's definitely an option. So this is this is a discussion between you and your, your CML treatment team and, and it's an option. So I, I mentioned on the slide that it's really only 20% of patients long-term 
um, who are able to stay off their tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So what about the 80%? And, and that's really important. Um, that's the vast majority of CML patients. And so we need to continue to think about what we can do. And here's what's actively being studied. Um, a second attempt at treatment for remission might be possible. There's some recent studies uh, showing that maybe about a third of patients who, who were not able to come off the first time who went back onto their tyrosine kinase inhibitor for another two years or so, um, about a third of them were able to successfully come off um, on a second attempt. So we're going to hear more data um, for second attempts at treatment for remission, uh, certainly in the coming years, because there's some ongoing clinical trials. Um, can we use additional treatments or combination treatments to make more patients eligible for treatment for remission? This is an active area of study. Can we combine TKIs with other classes of drugs to try to push more people into that deep response and make them candidates for treatment for remission? There are some ongoing clinical trials here that we will hear about in the coming years. I think it's an area that we need to be careful um, because, of course, quality of life is really important in CML. And so if we're adding on additional treatments to the tyrosine kinase inhibitor, we need to make sure that they're not therapies that are impairing patients' quality of life, not adding a lot of side effects um, uh, for patients. Um, for patients who uh, have not been able to uh, get to treatment for remission or who have uh, failed at one attempt at treatment for remission, um, the other option is minimizing the doses of tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So there are recent studies showing that for patients who are at least in a major molecular response, um, there are a certain proportion of them who are able to get away with a smaller dose of a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So this is something to talk about uh, with your team. If you're having bad side effects and you've been in a good response for a little while, but treatment for your remission is not an option for you. Um, I have some patients who are on uh, only a fraction of the dose um, that they started on were, and were maintaining uh, a major molecular response with less side effects. And so this is a viable option. So the bottom line uh, here is that about 40% of patients will be eligible to stop their CML treatment at some point, and half of these patients will remain in a long-term remission without medication. That is really a, a goal to strive for. Um, for those who are not candidates for stopping or when stopping fails, uh, we can try to minimize the dose of the tyrosine kinase inhibitor, and there are some emerging options like second attempts at stopping or combination or new treatments to allow more patients to be eligible for stopping. Um, I have a, a couple more slides, so let's talk about just briefly about recognizing those at risk for progression and, and intervening early. So I showed you this slide um, earlier. These are the milestones that we're aiming to achieve, especially the three-month uh, and the 12-month milestones. And so it's really important for us to have that follow-up lab work to make sure we're checking these boxes and, and we're hitting those milestones. Um, but why might some patients not meet those milestones? And there's a few things to think about. Um, it's adherence to the tyrosine kinase inhibitor. It's always the first thing we're asking. Are, are you taking your drug? Are you missing doses? And, and that's obvious. Um, one thing to think about um, that I've seen a few times now is drug interactions that limit absorption of the tyrosine kinase inhibitor um, and therefore limit the efficacy of the drug. So a common example is drugs that suppress acid um, for treatment of things like heartburn or reflux, uh, drugs like pantoprazole. Um, these drugs can interact with uh, the second generation uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, nilotinib, disatinib, um, and vasutinib, and they can actually reduce the amount of drug that gets into your body and therefore limit the effect um, of the drug. And so it's always important to check with your CML treatment team uh, the pharmacist on the team, if there is one, to make sure if you're starting a new drug that it's not going to interact with your tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Um, there are a couple of scenarios that I will stress are quite rare, but important for us to think about as CML treaters. Um, some patients have more than a translocation 922 at diagnosis. So some patients have additional abnormalities in their chromosomes in the bone marrow and these patients might be at higher risk of not responding to treatments. And so it's very important to have that follow-up lab work um, so that we can 
change treatment if it's if treatment is if the first line treatment is not working. Um, and sometimes in the course of treatment, there can be mutations that occur in the BCR ABL protein. So if you think about where a matinib binds, um, where I showed you on one of my first slides here, um, if the if this area where imatinib binds gets mutated and changes shape, the imatinib may, or other tyrosine kinase inhibitors may not be able to bind there and act effectively anymore. And so we can actually test for these mutations. Um, and sometimes the type of mutation that we find um, guides the tyrosine kinase inhibitor that's going to be effective. Um, and so it's really important to, for us as CML treaters to think about mutations in BCR ABL that might impair people's response to treatment to test for them and then to use those uh, results to guide uh, treatment. And then let's just touch on a novel therapy that many of you may have heard about um, that's uh, ha had some very promising results uh, recently, and this is a drug called Asiminib. So Asiminib is different than our traditional tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So you see here on the right uh, um, a model of the BCR ABL uh, protein, and the current TKIs bind uh, at this site. We call it the ATP site. Um, but the seminim is a drug that binds in a different area of the protein to shut it down. It's an area called the Meristoa pocket. Um, and the seminim has been made to perfectly fit this pocket um, and shut down BCR ABL. Um, the, the great thing about that is there should be a lot less what we call off-target effects because Asiminib is not a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. It should not be interfering with uh, tyrosine kinase receptors throughout the body. And so it should have a very different and uh, a very limited side effect profile uh, because it is very specific to this area on the BCR ABL protein. Um, and this drug has been approved by Health Canada very recently for patients treated with uh, previously treated with two or more tyrosine kinase inhibitors where the tyrosine kinase inhibitors either didn't work or were not tolerated. Um, this was based on a phase three study where Asiminib was compared to uh, a second generation tyrosine kinase inhibitor, Bosutinib, um, in this trial called Assemble. And what that trial showed um, was that more patients who received the Asiminib um, went on to achieve that three log reduction or major molecular response, 25%. This was at uh, uh, 24 weeks on treatment, and we expect this number is going to be higher with more follow-up. Um, there were also far less side effects with Asiminib, um, leading to discontinuation of treatment. Only 6% of patients who were treated with Asiminib had to stop because of side effects versus 21% with Basutinib. So it does appear to be a far better tolerated drug uh, than traditional tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And the typical tyrosine kinase inhibitor side effects like pain, swelling, and GI side effects are not very common with Asiminib. In this clinical trial, they occurred in 10% or less of patients. So it's a very promising drug that seems to be quite effective and very well tolerated. The um, ASC4 first study um, is ongoing right now. This is a study that is an international uh, study, including sites in Canada. It's running here in Calgary. I'm sure it's running at several other sites in Canada. And it's comparing Asiminib versus uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors as a first treatment for CML. So it's very exciting. Um, they planned to enroll 400 patients, and it's actually nearly fully enrolled at this point. And that's good news. Um, it means that we should have results, um, hopefully, in the coming uh, year. Um, to, to guide us in, in terms of this exciting therapy. Okay, so I will stop there. Um, I'm going to go over some submitted questions and then we will open it up to uh, the Q&A. So um, some of these questions here were, how many people are completely cured of their CML? Really depends what you, de what you define as a cure. Um, so if you define treatment-free remission, as I've, as I've mentioned, as a cure, then it's about 20% of patients. Um, those patients probably still have uh, a number of stem cells in their bone marrow affected by CML. It's just that the uh, immune system seems to be able to control those res residual stem cells and, and keep the CML under control. 
Um, so it's really what's called a functional cure. It's not that there's no CML left in the body, it's that the CML is uh, being well controlled by the immune system alone. Um, how many medications? Uh, we, we did answer this question. There's five medications, uh, imatinib and desatinib are generic um, with others uh, slated to become generic over the coming years. Um, what are the most reported cumulative side effects or concerns of long-term use of Gleevec or its generic formulations? Gleevec is, of course, imatinib, the first-generation tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Um, in terms of cumulative side effects of imatinib, there's a lot of experience now because the clinical trial started way back in the early 2000s, and there do not appear to be really many cumulative or long-term side effects. One of the side effects that I've been watching out for is uh, kidney disease or kidney dysfunction. Um, it appears that imatinib may be associated with uh, some loss of kidney function, but at this point, it appears that the loss of kidney function is uh, is relatively mild and, and may not even be significant. So it is something to, to watch for um, in, in patients who have been on Gleevec for a long time, but does not appear to be really majorly significant in terms of uh, treatment at this point. Um, and really there have, have been studies of Gleevec looking at um, heart, heart health, uh, looking at other cancers, and, and none of those have really shown uh, increased risks. So it is quite a safe drug in the long term. Um, is there a known association between dasatinib treatment and peripheral neuropathy? Um, there is. Um, unfortunately, this is an uncommon side effect of dasatinib, and in fact, really most of the tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Um, if you are having symptoms like numbness and tingling uh, in your fingers or toes, um, it's important to have, uh, have your CML treatment team know that that's happening. And usually, uh, patients will see a neurologist to have this worked up. Um, and sometimes we need to do a treatment change because of that. Um, what are the best supplements to assist in mitigation of the often severe fatigue resulting from TKI therapy? Great question. Um, the fatigue is probably the most challenging side effect that we see related to any cancer therapy. Um, as I've mentioned, there's a host of different um, possible approaches to fatigue. I think the non-supplement, non-medication options are the ones that have shown the most promise. These are things like the cognitive behavioral therapy, the mindfulness interventions, the yoga, the exercise interventions. These have probably shown the most promise. Um, I'm not aware of any supplements. Um, there have been some, uh, there's been some work looking at ginseng uh, for, for chronic cancer related fatigue that have shown some mixed results in terms of whether it helps or not. Ginseng importantly has important interactions with drugs. And so if you're going to use ginseng, you should, uh, I strongly encourage you to run it by your CML team and other doctors to make sure there's no interactions with uh, drugs that you're taking. Um, are body rashes common with CML? We did cover that. Um, yes, they are. Um, is bone marrow transplant a cure for this? Um, yes, bone marrow transplant can represent a cure for CML. Um, the challenge is bone marrow transplant is a very intensive treatment. It has many side effects. It has many risks associated with it. And so tyrosine kinase inhibitors are the preferred treatment rather than bone marrow transplant. Um, but there is a subset of patients who don't respond well to tyrosine kinase inhibitors where we do end up using bone marrow transplant um, as, a, as a backup treatment, but this is becoming less and less common. Um, and you know, hopefully with new drugs like Asimineb, you know, the hope is eventually no patients will need a bone marrow transplant for CML. Um, in the next few weeks, I'll begin a new drug protocol. How can I best prepare myself? Um, you know, it's important if you're starting a, a new treatment to, uh, you know, plan plan your life and and try and take try and take as much off your plate. That's hard to do for many people. Um, take as much off your plate as possible. Um, make sure you're getting the rest you need. Um, set some realistic expectations for yourself about what you're going to be able to get done because you might be experiencing some side effects that are new or unexpected. Know who to call from your treatment team if you're having side effects. Um, have, a, have a plan um, for, uh, for your follow-up blood work um, and you know, pay attention to your nutrition and, and adequate rest, I, I'd say are all really important. And where would one get info re CML variants, three way translocations uh, and research? Um, I'd say the best way to, to you know, get info, it sounds like this question is someone who's maybe is quite advanced in their knowledge. 
um, of CML. I would look at uh, three journals, uh, Blood, uh, have a look on the website there. Many of the articles are coming out open access, and so you, you don't necessarily need a uh, subscription. Blood advances, um, also some very good articles on CML coming out there. And that is an open access journal where you don't need um, a, a subscription. Um, and the other journal would be Leukemia, um, where a lot of high quality CML research is published. Um, again, many of the articles are coming out open access. Um, if you find an article that's not open access, one of the ways you can try to get access to it, um, other than subscribing to the journal, which um, is often far too expensive, um, is by using a, a website called ResearchGate, um, where you might be able to find the author of the paper and send a request for them to send you a, a full text of the article. You might be able to also ask your CML treatment team because they should have access through their university um, to uh, that journal and they may be able to get access uh, to that um, particular article for you. So um, we will open it up to the Q&A for the people that are logged on here with us. Thank you so much, Dr. Giovanni. Uh, for sharing your expertise and your insight with all of us today. So, you know, we really appreciate your time coming in today and presenting to us. Um, so yes, it is now time for that question and answer period. As we mentioned earlier, due to the large number of participants and limited time, uh, we won't be able to get to all of the questions, but, um, we also cannot answer any specific questions about a person's health status. This is not a private consultation. Uh, if we do not get to your question during this live presentation, a community service lead will connect with you directly after the webcast. Uh, we had quite a few questions coming in, so I'm going to kind of just start here at the top. Um, so the first question that came in was, is CML a gateway to other cancers, for example, skin cancers? That's a great question, and uh, and so far it does not appear to be the case. So there have been some longitudinal studies looking at patients with CML and, and their risk of other cancers, and so far those studies do not seem to show uh, that patients with CML have an elevated risk of other cancers. Perfect, thank you. Uh, the next question, uh, you kind of touched on it a little bit, but can you re-explain the consequences of changes to chromosomes nine and 22 after breaking? Yeah, so um, what happens is really the consequence is that uh, you have two genes on chromosome nine, you have a gene on nine and a gene on 22, um, ABL and, and BCR. And, and those genes, their function as they are, um, as they are in, in normal health with, you know, isolated on chromosome nine and 22, the function of those genes is not actually really well known. It's only when those genes come together through the translocation between nine and 22 that you get the combination BCR-ABL. And now you've got a fusion gene um, that leads to uh, that leads to CML um, because it's a it's a gene it's a fusion gene that um, leads to proliferation of white blood cells um, that is uncontrolled. So really, it's what happens with really the consequence of the recombination of nine and twenty two is you put BCR and ABL together and you get a, a BCL this BCR ABL fusion protein that is driving CML. Correct. Right. Um, and is there much information on the impact of being on TKIs long term? Yes, there is. There is really uh, starting to be uh, for for imatinib. We've got long term data um, because the original trial, the IRIS trial, was done in the early two thousands. So there's follow up for patients uh, getting well out to fifteen plus years, and, and that's why we can say. Um, you know, particularly for imatinib, there really do not appear to be any long-term safety signals. Um, for the second-generation drugs, dasatinib, nilotinib, um, basutinib, there's starting to be uh, five to 10-year data coming out, um, even for those. And um, really, the, the safety signal that has come out of those does appear to be the increased risk of cardiovascular events, particularly with nilotinib to a lesser extent, the satinib, and to an even lesser extent, basutinib. Um, and so, you know, if you're thinking about long-term side effects of those drugs, really, you got to think about how do I reduce my chance of having a 
stroke or heart attack. And really it comes back to um, making sure that you're going to your family doctor and you're having your cholesterol checked and you're having your blood sugar checked, you're having your blood pressure checked because in the clinical trials, um, when these events were looked at in more detail, the patients who had these events, um, the vast majority of them did have underlying risk factors for these events. That means high cholesterol, high blood pressure, um, high blood sugar, um, smoking. And so if you know you make a concerted effort, like all of us should, to control all of those risk factors, your risk of having those events will be quite a bit less. So just related back to that, uh, what, can TKI side effects lead to syndromes such as uh, IBS, so irritable bowel syndrome? Uh, not specifically irritable bowel syndrome, but we do know that there are GI side effects of these drugs, um, particularly imatinib and basutinib. And so patients can have, uh, uh, so I've seen patients with some element of chronic diarrhea, or a low-grade chronic nausea. So, you know, I guess the symptoms could very much look like IBS, but they're really more related to the drug. Um, I guess that's where I'd, I'd leave that. Um, and would muscle cramps include uh, spasms in the throat? I have not heard of that one before. Um, I, I hear spasms in the throat and I hear, and, I, and I'm concerned about that. Um, I, I, would, I would definitely check that out with your team because spasms in the throat is not a typical side effect of any of the tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Um, and, and it does sound rather concerning to me if someone's having spasms uh, in their throat. So I, I would definitely have that one checked out. Um, to make sure there's not something different going on there. Um, and is prolonged numbness and skin discoloration in my fingers a known symptom of matinib and what should be done? It doesn't tend to be. I mean, there there is a rare association between um, these drugs and uh, ne peripheral neuropathy. So that might be numbness and tingling in the fingers. Um, that should not necessarily be accompanied by changes in, in skin coloration. Um, I would wonder whether those symptoms might be related to the cold. Um, and if so, um, and, and the fingers are turning, you know, white and, and blue, that might be something called Raynaud's phenomenon, which may be unrelated to the tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So again, something to, to probably check out um, with, your, with your healthcare team, um, because I, you know, don't think that would be very typical of the of the of a TKI side effect. Um, and how do people find out what research studies are currently ongoing? Yeah, it's it's a little bit it's a little bit hard. I'd say probably the best way is um, a website called clinicaltrials.gov. Um, this is a website that's searchable. Um, you should be able to search up uh, CML or chronic myeloid leukemia into the search box. And, and actually um, that website is fairly comprehensive. So it should bring up uh, a list of basically any registered clinical trial happening for CML. I think that is really the best. Um, if, you know, if you're inquiring about clinical trial options um, at your particular center, then, then definitely speaking with your, your team um, about what trials might be open locally for you. Just keeping an eye on the time. I think we have time for maybe two more questions really quickly. Um, so we'll pull up. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Uh, regarding TFR, if you try it once and relapse, could you potentially try it again if you meet the criteria again in the future? Yeah, and so that there is emerging data suggesting that yes, that might be the case. So um, there is there is a clinical trial or two published, and there's more to be published in, in the coming years, I think. Um, and yes, it is possible uh, in, in the one clinical trial published that I'm aware of, um, in this exact scenario, about a third of patients were able to successfully come off their, uh, their TKI um, after a, a second try at TFR. So it's definitely something to discuss with your, with your um, CML team because uh, it is something that we're still learning about. 
Um, but it does appear that that might be an option in the future um, for sure. Perfect, thank you. So last question that I will have you answer um, is what stops the bone marrow myeloid stem cell from having chromosomes mutated? <laughs> 